let's speak about uh, the crisis. Yeah, okay. how do people, uh, could people already feel the crisis? Because it was very good what you are talking about. Okay. And people going into this election uh, under severe duress, basically. The polling data, you know, I've been watching sort of big picture stuff for many years. Um, <clears throat> international relations, particularly uh, things between great powers, the possibility of a major war. I've always been concerned about that because, you know, with the installed material it would be devastating. It could kill all of us, basically. And and the situation with the, with the U.S. confronting uh, Russia and China, particularly, I would say, from the second term of the Obama administration forward, um, has been troubling to me. I, I was alive during the so-called Cuban Missile Crisis. And so uh, as the uh, situation has grown more uh, heated um, and be has become a hot war like in earnest, I mean, there's been a war ongoing for at least eight years there, of course, but you know, now it's front and center in the media here. And by the way, the U.S. government is dropping tens of billions of dollars every month into it. And people have been discussing uh, what would happen in the event of a nuclear exchange, including some of the media here having uh, sort of the old duck and cover style uh, TV spots, what to do in the event of a nuclear disaster uh, in the media. And so I, looking at this election and, and not seeing a response from the people as this crisis has intensified, I wondered, like, what, what are they going to do in terms of voting? I'm in a suburban district in New York, okay, the 17th Congressional District. And the member of Congress who is the incumbent here, his name is uh, Sean Patrick Murphy. He's a Democrat. He's a Clinton Democrat. He belongs to the Clintons. Um, it, it just as an incidental, uh, he's gay, he's married to, he's a male lover, and uh, he has an adopted uh, black lesbian daughter. Okay, that is for the first six months of his campaign, all he told us about. Nothing about policy, nothing about this war that's going on, for example, nothing about the 40 years of austerity that the West has been you know, suffering on an increasing basis, nothing about raging inflation, nothing about the health care and housing and, and food insecurity, none of that. Who he was, who he's married to, and this is my daughter, that was basically his campaign. Then the Republicans selected someone. And he has pointed to uh, Sean Patrick Murphy. Uh, his name is Mike Lawler. And he's been saying, in, in essence, uh, this guy's responsible for inflation. Uh, this guy's responsible for uh, doing away with bail on uh, people charged with crimes. So he's made the, the streets dangerous, and he's made everything more expensive for you. Those are the two sides. Not a word about... Uh, you know, almost $100 billion out of the uh, federal budget to go to Ukraine to get blown up, stolen, or to induce World War III. N nothing about people being evicted, foreclosed, starving, out of uh, health care, none of that stuff. That's not on the, on the ballot. And now th the issues that the Democrats have found in polling are important. One, this they've uh, jazzed up the January 6th, uh, 2021 uh, Capitol uh, building occupation, you know, the protest and uh, the occupation for the several hours of the Capitol as being an attempted uh, coup d'etat. And they say basically the Republicans, each and every one of them who haven't fully condemned that as an act of treason, uh, are a threat to the American democracy. So that's what's on the ballot. So you ask people in polls what matters to you the war is below number nine. It doesn't even register. They're worried about inflation. They're worried about unemployment. They're worried about housing insecurity. They're worried about food insecurity. They're worried about health care insecurity, real stuff that is impacting their lives by the millions. Now, the situation here has been going on since the, really since the late 90s. It's been an increasing problem, not so coincidentally, you know, we've had a, an increasing uh, budget over the regular military budget, beginning with the war in Iraq and Afghanistan on an ongoing basis now, Libya, Syria, and all these other adventures. 
certainly that has some impact on the economy. It's just invisible because no one makes the connection. But in addition to that, we've had since Joe Biden took office in 2021, on January 20th, 2021, I use a benchmark of gasoline prices. The corner gas station by me was at $1.99 a gallon for regular unleaded petrol. That's on January 20th, 2021. On January 20th, 2022, which is before uh, the uh, Russian action in Ukraine, uh, that was over $5, in fact, was approaching 6 And in some places in the U.S. was under 10 by a couple of cents out in the Bay Area in California, for example. This, of course, gets expressed through the whole economy. Food prices have skyrocketed. Uh, health care costs and also health care insurance have skyrocketed. My energy bill, I got a notice from uh, Con Edison, who's the <clears throat> supplier of my electricity and the gas for my heat, informed me that next month my electricity is going to go up 27% and my heat is going to go up 31%. My uh, income as a pensioner is not going to go up 27% or 31%. And this is the situation facing many people. In fact, I, I'm relatively fortunate among the uh, people my age, certainly, and among the population in general in the United States. I worked a full career in a profession for 50 years, and I was married to someone that did also. We didn't have children. We saved money and, and all of that. Um, and I'm having a hard time. Most people, I think, are feeling desperate if they're not actually desperate yet. And it doesn't look like it's going to get any better because Biden and the Democrats are not offering anything that's going to change. They say everything's OK. Yeah. And what about uh, the medical care, uh, the in medical insurance and, and so on? OK. So in the United States, if you're a salaried worker, there's a deduction taken from your paycheck. Uh, for Medicare. There's also one for Social Security. These are insurance funds, basically, that begin to pay out when you retire. Uh, people that do day labor, by the way, or, or piecework of one kind or another, they're supposed to put that money aside, but very often they can't afford to, and so they don't get that benefit when they turn 65. But those of us who did and uh, were fortunate enough to be able to put in enough so the payout is useful, at least, um, uh, get uh, a uh, Medicare uh, insurance coverage that covers 80% of most of the uh, uh, costs of uh, health care that you might need. Not all of them. There are some things that are not included that can be very expensive. Uh, I would say a heart transplant, for example. Also, if you're in the hospital beyond a certain period of time, it stops covering you. So uh, people buy supplemental insurance. And because my wife worked at IBM for 30 years or whatever, I have a very good uh, you know, piece of uh, private insurance relative to what's available. I've been paying about $1,100, $1,200 per quarter, about $400 a month. Uh, that was up this year by uh, somewhere around 11 or 12% over last year. And that's going to go up this year another 15%. Now, my, again, my income is fixed, and it's not going to go up by those factors, and so I'm feeling pressure there, too. For most people, uh, first, there, there are millions that don't even have uh, Medicare, although there are certain kinds of coverage that are available for people that are impoverished and, and, and not, and not uh, eligible. Um, and, but the, the, that health care is restricted. You can only use these doctors you know, that are on their plan, um, and the, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the TV commercials here for banks with the guy, when you apply for a loan that goes, no, no, no. <laughs> there are uh, coverage out of a lot of the insurance companies for people that are, you know, not well to do, um, denies most of the, you know, claim, or denies many of the claims. And so that coverage is not adequate for most people. Um, and, uh, you know, there are millions of people, though, that are in a, in a position like I am that are not going to be able to cover the increased costs. And, and certainly lots of those people are people on fixed incomes, that, which is, creates part of the problem, meaning that they are in retirement, meaning that they're older and they're going to need more health care than someone in their 20s or 30s, for example. And so you're seeing a crisis uh, developing in, in that area. Uh, and, and we've seen food prices 
uh, go up is more or less tracking gasoline prices. Um, and uh, aside from energy, food, uh, medical care, uh, we have millions of tens of millions of people saddled with education debt. And, you know, Biden promised to deal with that. And then he promised that he was doing something. And as it turns out, that's meager also. And so, again, the people here are feeling in very material ways the serious problems that face them. And the only thing that the Democrats have been offering uh, in uh, response is rhetoric about uh, either electing Republicans as a threat to democracy, uh, or on the other hand, uh, Roe v. Wade. Uh, we will reinstate Roe v. Wade, we promise this time. By the way, that's something that they could do today if they just passed it in, in Congress. They have a majority of both houses and a Democratic president. So and, people are suspicious about that, too. And uh, the increase of the base rate and uh, as a... Oh, interest rate, and yeah. Interest rate, yeah. Uh, on top of all of that, you have um, millions of people who have uh, loans of one fashion or another, uh, whether mortgage loans, car loans, uh, credit card debt, uh, that... Uh, has a an interest rate that varies with the marketplace. Um, in the U.S., uh, commercial uh, and uh, banking uh, transactions, uh, in essence, when you borrow money, uh, you make a promise, a written promise to pay it back, um, and also you pay interest on the money that you borrowed. This is the incentive for the lender to lend you the money, that they're going to get back more than they loaned you. And there are is a risk built into it that you won't pay them back. And so that interest rate also takes into account the theoretical risk across a body of lenders. So one mechanism that's used is a fixed rate. We know what the interest rate is today. Say on a 10-year loan, it's going to be the same for the entire 10 years. So I know I have to pay $238.17 a month now and for every month between now and the end of 10 years. So I can budget for that. Um, Others, because uh, interest rates fluctuate um, and lenders are sometimes reluctant to lend fixed rate today when they might get twice as much next year with the same money, they have the interest rate in the loan float with the market. In other words, say you have what they call a prime rate, a uh, prime lending rate of uh, 2%, uh, and they will do a loan 2% uh, plus uh, two points over prime. So. That when I close on that loan, the day that I borrow the money, I'm owing 4% on it. If the prime rate goes up to 12%, that month or the month after or shortly thereafter, I'm now required to pay 14%. Well, if my wage were tied to that, that might not be a problem. But in fact, that's not how it works. The wage is the one thing that's fixed pretty hard in the economy. And if, if you can keep it at the same rate without it, it sliding, and uh, so that creates a, a, you know, a crunch for people that are uh, required to, to pay on these variable rate loans. In fact, there are tens of millions of people with variable rate mortgages and with what they call HELOC or second mortgages with variable rates that are you know, going into distress every time the rate has gone up. And it's gone up substantially now over the last year. And also those with car loans, those generally are a uh, um, uh, variable rate and credit card debt, which is almost all. A variable rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, what uh, does the polls uh, say about uh, the possibility Repub uh, Republicans uh, take the majority in the upcoming elections? Okay. Right, so the Democrats right now have a majority in the Senate and the House. Do you have uh, Congress, which is the American equivalent of Parliament or Duma? Uh, has two houses, um, two chambers. What they call the upper chamber, the Senate, has 100 members, uh, two members from each of the 50 states, uh, regardless of population, regardless of geographic size. Um, and then you have the House of Representatives, which has 435 members right now. Um, and those uh, members are allocated to the states based on population. So the most populous of the states has the most representatives and the least populous has the fewest representatives. Um, in each of those two houses, the Democrats right now have a majority. Um, 
This is what they call an off-year election. Um, the president of the United States is elected every four years, the leap year. And the members of the House of Representatives are elected every two years. Um, the members of the Senate, which has 100 members, are elected every six years. Every two years, one-third of the Senate is up for re-election. So this year, one-third of the Senate is up for re-election, and the entire House of Representatives is up for re-election. The president is not up for re-election. Uh, again, we have Democratic president, Democratic Senate, Democratic House. Um, the people right now that are sitting in the House of Representatives ran with Joe Biden in 2020, um, and they won a majority with him as he won the election, as the official results say. Um, traditionally, if the presidency is uh, uh, sitting on top of a successful economic uh, picture, um, then that party will get reelected uh, in the off-year election, the midterm election. And if there's an economic stress or some other catastrophic uh, event, um, except for an event like 9-11 where the public rallies behind the president, uh, then generally you see the other party, the out-of-power uh, party, make gains and even take control of one or both houses of Congress. This year, President Biden is the least popular president, according to polling data, in the history of the United States since the day before Richard Nixon resigned. And as a matter of fact, his negative poll numbers have been now for almost a year um, about exactly where Nixon's were the day he was forced to resign from office. And the only time that's happened in the history of the U.S. So Biden is clearly a liability to the people that are running for Congress on his party. The polling data shows that it's quite possible that Republicans are going to take control of both houses. Now, that, there's some significance to that on several grounds. The two most significant ones are first, in my opinion, first, um, the Republicans have been the only ones who have voted in either house against continue, uh, continued funding for the war in Ukraine. Um, their last vote on just that issue, where it wasn't bundled with uh, other appropriations bills, um, had, uh, I think it was uh, 11 uh, senators out of 100, but 11 out of the 40-something that the uh, Republicans have, and 69 members of the House voted against the appropriation. Um, it wasn't enough to carry the vote, but it was the only dissonant voice in the entire political economy here. There, Except for Tucker Carlson, for example, you don't hear a word of criticism of U.S. policy uh, against Russia across the entire media scape including the so-called progressive media, Democracy Now!, Pacifica Radio, uh, et cetera. This is something that, that is, is, in essence, the entire uh, Wurlitzer uh, is being programmed, it seems, from Langley, uh, and there's complete and total media support for this war. This body of opposition that's you know nestled inside the two houses of Congress, if the Republicans are to take charge, and there has been discussion uh, including by the most likely uh, Speaker of the House, that in the event uh, the Republicans take a majority, they are going to curb their funding for the war. So that's the first thing. The other is a number of people uh, across the Republican spectrum have said, if we get control of the House, we're going to try to impeach Joe Biden over this war and over some of the other things that he's done that we think are illegal. And if we have control of both houses, we think we can have the Senate convict him and remove him from office. I see. Great. I, we made it.